Welcome to the National Math and Science Initiative's Professional Development video series on Advanced Placement Physics 2. This is Module 2, Circuits, including Capacitance. Part A, we're going to go over how circuits appears on the AP exam. My name is John Frinsley. I teach at Prosper High School in Prosper, Texas, and I have a website. It's a Facebook page, really, Friendsley AP Physics. You are invited to check the Friendsley AP Physics Facebook page. Just type Friendsley Physics Facebook into Google. You'll find it. If you like Friendsley Physics or your students, which are invited, like Friendsley AP Physics, you and they will see example questions in your news feed for Facebook posted daily, Solutions on Saturday. Saturday. All right, the focus of this unit on circuits, electric circuits, that obviously it's called circuits, but these electric circuits in AP Physics 2, these are circuits that can consist of one or more batteries, no, no alternating current, only DC direct current. The batteries may be ideal, may not be ideal, this AP Physics 2. Resistors, they could be ohmic, they're assumed to be ohmic unless they are otherwise stated as not being ohmic. Or sometimes students will be asked, how are you going to come up with uh, an experiment to figure out whether this resistor is ohmic? Switches, ammeters and voltmeters assumed to be ideal unless we say otherwise, and capacitors. No other types of circuit elements, transistors, inductors, or anything like that. All right, so for all AP Physics 2 exam items, so what we did is so we looked at all the AP Physics 2 exam items, free response, multiple choice, multi marks that have been released, including the ones behind the audit wall. So, course description, um, multiple choice from behind the audit wall, free response that have been made public, free response that have not been made public, and we uh, categorized all of them into each of these modules, and of the modules, Modules that we have come up with for NIMSI, 19% of all the points that have ever, of all the questions, all the points, all the questions ever been published for AP Physics 2 land in the circuits category. 19%. It's like electrostatics is also 19%. That's almost a fifth of the exam. A fifth of the exam items by point value ever released have been on circuits. So we would obviously recommend that you use 19% of your class time on circuits its topics. So that means that if you're taking 30 weeks, we're going to spend about six full weeks on circuits. Now that comes with a caveat though. Let me tell you what the caveat is. If your students have all taken AP Physics 1 and I know you're going to laugh and they had a good exposure to circuits, I hear you laughing on the other side of your computer screen. You and I know that sometimes you skip on circuits or it gets crammed in on the last three days because you ran out of time in AP Physics 1. You know it and I know it. You ain't fooling anybody. But if that's you, please give the full six weeks to circuits. But if you feel like your kids got a solid exposure to circuits, maybe you can do less than six weeks. Don't beat a dead horse. Maybe a week or two of review. Remind them of what they learned. And then bring in the stuff that's new. Not ideal batteries, capacitors, all that stuff. Think carefully. Remember, if you take less time on circuits because you can afford to, then that's more time for review or other things like magnetism or something like that. What's really important that students understand the difference between students say voltage, students say current, students say power. Do they really understand what those things are. Do they really understand electric potential? That electric potential tells us a number of joules for every coulomb. Do they understand the difference between that and current? Current is the flow of charge, the amount of charge, the coulombs of charge that pass the point every single second. Are you talking to your kids about this? I remind them every day and in P1 as well, especially in P1. Do they understand electric power? Power is how much energy is transferred every second. Transferred, whether that means from the battery to the charges, how many joules was transferred from the battery's chemistry to the charges passing to the battery every second. Or was the energy transferred from the charges to a light bulb? How many joules of energy was transferred from the charges to the light bulb every second? Okay, that's important. Now. This one may be new for you. You've heard them before. EMF, voltage, voltage drop, electric potential, potential difference. What are those things? They're all measured in volts. 
Are they all the same thing? I would encourage you to understand the difference between them, even though they're measured in volts, and then impart on your students the difference between them. Here we go, get ready. EMF stands for electromotive force. That is the amount of energy that is given to every unit of charge. A nine volt battery has an EMF of nine volts. Every Coulomb that goes through the nine volt battery is given nine joules of energy. The battery is giving to the charges nine joules of energy for every Coulomb. EMF is about the charges receiving energy. Voltage drop is the opposite. Voltage drop is about charges losing their energy or giving up their energy. That happens in resistors. So if a resistor has a voltage drop of four volts, that means that every Coulomb that passes through that resistor, every Coulomb of charge delivers four, cool, uh, four joules of energy. So I imagine the circuit is like a pizza delivery service where the pizza delivery guys go past or through, maybe it's a drive-through. The pizza delivery guys drive through the drive-through and they receive pizzas. They go through the drive-through. It's like a battery. The charges receive energy. Then they deliver pizzas to each house. That's the charge delivering energy to different parts of the circuit, different resistors. EMF, how many joules does each Coulomb receive from the battery? Voltage drop, how many, how many joules of energy does each Coulomb give away to the resistor, to the light bulb, to the speaker, to the TV? Now, EMF and voltage drop are both what are called potential differences. A potential difference is when the amount of energy held by the charges changes. Say that again. The amount of energy held by the charges changes. In a battery, the charges get more energy. That's a potential difference, getting more energy. In a resistor, charges lose energy. That's a voltage drop, another example of potential difference. So EMF is a potential difference, get it, the charge is getting energy. Voltage drop is a potential difference, the charge is losing energy. And then what is electric potential? Well, EMF is the energy given to each charge. Voltage drop is the energy taken away from each charge. But electric potential is just the amount of energy owned or possessed by each charge. So, when the pizza delivery guys go through the Pizza Hut drive-thru, they receive pizza. In the same way, charges receive energy from the battery, EMF. As the pizza delivery guy goes to his customer's house, he possesses those pizzas. He has them. He owns them. He's carrying them. In the same way, the charges carry the energy with them around the wires of the circuit. That's electric potential. The charges get energy, the charges hold on to the energy, the charges drop off the energy, the charges come back for more energy. Okay, topics that show up a lot on the exam. Here they come. Okay, if you have already seen this three-segment naming convention in another module like Module 1, feel free to just kind of skip past the video until you don't see me talking about it anymore. Uh, if you're doing these modules out of order, you'll need to see this. So what you're about to see is I'm going to talk about different topics that show up a lot on the exam, and each one is going to have a set of example questions I would ask you to look at to help you understand what it looks like on an AP Physics 2 exam. Even uh, even exams like the C mechanics or CE mag exam do ask questions sometimes the same way as physics too. So each question up here is shown as a three segment identifier. First, second, third segment separated by dashes. Okay, so what's the first segment? It's the type of the exam that the question came from. Did it come from an old physics B exam? B. Come from a P1, a P2 exam? P1 or P2. Did it come from a C mechanics or C electricity mag? We're probably not going to see a lot of C mechanics in this. We might but no, um, or electricity magnetism that has those headers, right? Those uh, for the first segment. Second segment, the exam year, the year the exam came out. If the letter P appears before the exam year, that's a practice exam that is behind the audit wall and is not publicly available. If you see the P in front of the exam year. If you see the PRAC instead of a year, that's the prototype practice exam that is from behind the audit wall that was never used as a real operational exam. If you see APCD, then that's a question that came out of the course description, which is publicly available on the College World website and has sample multiple choice free responses in it. Third segment is the question type and the question number. So MC for multiple choice, MM if you have to bubble two, that's a multi-mark, and free responses FR. Here's an example. 
P2. This question came from an old Physics 2 exam. This question came from the 2016 Physics 2 exam that's behind the audit wall, P. This question is the first free response question on this exam. This question also came from P2, but it came from, from the Physics 2 course description available on College Board. It's multiple question, choice question number nine. Your students have to understand Kirchhoff's laws. There's no options there. They may remember it from P1. What about Ohm's law? I equals potential difference, voltage drop, over resistance. And they also need to understand Joule's law, which if you've forgotten, P equals IV, P equals V squared over R, P equals I squared times R. Those are all three different ways of writing Joule's law. Joule's law of energy transfer. You'll see that it shows up quite a bit on AP Physics 2, but really, it shows up really, really, really a lot on Physics 1. So what I would tell you, if you're getting kids from Physics 1 into Physics 2, and all your kids in Physics 2, you had control over in Physics 1, you need to do a good job of teaching circuits. It shows up a lot on Physics 1 as well. Let's do yourself a favor. Okay, when I talk about qualitative circuit analysis, Analysis. I'm talking about the questions where it's like a switch opens. So um, does the light bulb get brighter or dimmer when this switch opens? Or when you unscrew a light bulb? Or when you screw in a new light bulb? Or here's an arrangement of light bulbs, some parallel, some series, some you know mixed. Which ones are brighter? Which ones are dimmer? Why? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that is not yet shown up on a release AP Physics 2 exam. Um, but there are several instances of it showing up on old free responses for physics B. I would go hunt these physics B uh, free responses down and I would look at them and I would use them. I think it's a valuable uh, skill for students to learn. Uh, being able to talk qualitatively about Kirchhoff's laws, I would strongly encourage you uh, to have that, those conversations with your students because you know something, it's going to show up on the physics 2 exam. It's going to. Resistance and resistivity, uh, they really love to have students talk about what happens if the resistor was twice the width, twice the diameter or twice the length. Um, how do you experimentally find resistivity? That's going to be on the P2 exam really soon. I'm sure it will. So we want to talk about that. We're going to talk about that in the second video of this module, Part B. How can you find the resistivity of a material in a laboratory? Pretty big deal. Okay. So here's some example questions on resistance and resistivity. These are pretty good uh, EMAG questions from behind the audit wall. I think that you can access the CE EMAG um, uh, practice exams from behind the audit wall. If not, there's, I don't know, uh, I'm sure you can get them from somewhere. Maybe NIMSY will give them to you. Okay. You got to teach your students about batteries that have an internal resistance. Thank you for playing. You have to. You've got to teach them about how to deal with resistors that are not ohmic. So these are questions that might help you with that. Look at all the times that's appeared on P2 in the three years that P2 has existed. There's also a couple of physics B free responses I would point you toward. They're pretty good. Um, you might remember if you've been teaching AP Physics 1 since the beginning. Free response number two, how would you use, modify your lab setup to determine whether the, a resistor is ohmic or non-ohmic? Yeah, I bet you enjoyed that one. Uh, I know the kids did. That's a pretty good one too, that EMAG question, free response number two. Um, all right, capacitors. What do they actually do? How do they store energy? What's the relationship between capacitance and plate area and plate separation? What's a dielectric do? What's that all about, this dielectric thing? What about the energy or charge stored in a capacitor? How's that related to the capacitor's potential difference? It's voltage. So um, these are problems. You'll see that there are a few from P2. But really, most of them come from electricity and magnetism. So you're like, well, wait a minute, it doesn't show up very often on P2. But I would tell you, when it shows up on P2, either your students know it and it's easy and they can bang it out on the multiple choice in 20 seconds, or they don't know it and they're, and they're in trouble. So give them some practice. Use these old B and C EMAG questions to give them practice. Okay, now what about when the capacitor is actually stuck in a circuit? Like, what happens after, right after the switch is closed? What happens a long time after the switch is closed? 
What about in between, right after the switch is closed, a long time after the switch and close, which we call the transient behavior, in between, immediately after, a long time after? Be warned, there's no calculus in physics too. So that means that students, when the capacitor is in the circuit, they're either going to answer questions about what happens right after the switch is closed, or they're going to answer questions about a long time after the switch is closed, or they're only going to qualitatively talk about what happens in between the switch closing and the final steady state of the circuit. Feel free to pause and you can take a screenshot if you want. You can do that at any point in any of these videos. Pause, take a screenshot, and then um, look up these questions and see how these are asked on AP Physics 2 exams. And you're more than welcome to use these during um, your practice or whatever. These are the questions, by the way, I separated these out with the space. These are the ones that talk about qualitatively what happens in between the switch immediately closing and a long time after. All the other ones over here, though, these deal with either immediately after the switch is closed or a long time after. What are you going to do hands-on? Um, I would tell you, qualitative light bulb circuit um, switch battery stuff. All right, so, and you should be doing that in P1 as well. So the thing where you give them two batteries and three light bulbs and two switches and you say, uh, make the two bulbs uh, dim and one of the light bulbs bright or something like that. Uh, what happens if they're all in parallel or all in series? What happens if you have one bulb and two bulbs and three bulbs in series? That kind of qualitative stuff. Make the students diagram the circuit that they're drawing and describe with Kirchhoff's laws. Why are these two resistors dimmer than the other one. If you have current going through one resistor and then splitting through two resistors or light bulbs, why is the one bright and the two dim? They need to talk about the current having the split between the two that are dim. Or what if you have uh, a single resistor but then or light bulb and then two light bulbs in series? Well, the two light bulbs in series are dimmer than the single light bulb uh, in its own branch because the charges have to give half of their energy then the other half their energy is a light bulb. That's a Kirchhoff loop rule. Make them explain qualitatively using Kirchhoff's uh, laws. Okay. Lab. We have several labs for this. Um, beware that I would do the resistivity lab in P1. I feel like resistivity is going to show up quite a bit in P1. Um, the is it ohmic or is it non-ohmic lab, I would also do that in AP Physics 1. Um, but if you haven't done it yet, have them do it AP, or do it again, have them remember it or something like it. I have a second resistivity lab that you could use in AP Physics 2. It's harder than the one that I use in AP Physics 1. So that might be something. Then we're going to do a capacitor lab. You're going to see these labs illustrated to you in parts B and C of this module. Uh, for on paper, you've seen them before, just the circuits questions, the circuits problems. Here's a battery. Here's four resistors. Here's the resistance of the resistors. Here's what the circuit looks like. Calculate the potential difference in the current and the power for each of these elements. That kind of thing you got to do on circuits, uh, on paper. Class discussion. Talk to them, have them talk qualitatively. Okay, now that you've solved the circuit problem, what if resistor D burned out so that no current could go through resistor D? Or what, so what would happen to the other resistors? Would they have more or less voltage current power? What if resistor D had some kind of malfunction where resistor D um, had zero resistance for some reason, some weird short circuit took place. Well, what would that do to the circuits, to the currents and voltages and powers in other parts of the circuits? Have your students explain using Kirchhoff's laws. Uh, well, and talk about, you know, um, how you combine resistors. Well, now the total resistance is less, so the total current provided by the battery is more, uh, but all that current is going to go through this route instead of that route. Those are the kind of things you want them to talk about. All right, so join me for part B when we talk about uh, resistors, resistant. Oh, you want to know something I forgot in this lab list? Non-ideal batteries. That's a lab we're going to do in part B. Then part C, it's all capacitors all the time. Going to do all kinds of stuff with the capacitors in part C.